I'm very glad to have this opportunity. I've been up here in front of you in a couple of different roles before, uh, singing and also giving communion meditation, but it's a great privilege to be able to preach to you. I am very glad that we're going to have the continuation soon of having Jacob here uh, filling the pulpit regularly and uh, I'm sure you all are happy about that too. Um, I do want to give a little bit of a background to the sermon this morning and this is where the bit about uh, introducing myself uh, comes in. Uh, a lot of you know, I think, and some of you possibly don't, that I'm a missionary kid. My parents uh, started a church in Hong Kong uh, that at the time that I graduated from Ozark in uh, 74 and a couple of years later went back to Hong Kong, uh, with the, largely with the guidance of my brother Ben, the Hong Kong church was working towards becoming independent of the missionaries. And so once they did that for a while, although they didn't have uh, the funds to uh, pay for a regular minister, the male members of the congregation uh, preached in rotation, uh, kind of a familiar situation to what we've had right here. And the, there was a committee that set up the topics of the sermon so that there would be that much continuity, even though it was different people preaching. And when it came up to my part in the rotation one year, um, the topic assigned to me was in four, a four-character phrase in Chinese. Ji uh, gei, ji bei in Cantonese pronunciation. And this was very unfamiliar to me. It means no self, and know the other one. Okay, w where do I go with that? So I did a little bit of research and found out that it was actually a quotation from a Chinese, a historic Chinese work that is used actually in training by militaries throughout the world. Uh, Usually in English, his uh, name is pronounced Sun Zi or Sun Tzu. Uh, but he was a general that used some uh, old sayings in addition to fleshing them out and giving his own interpretation of them and application to them. And where this thing of know yourself, know the other one comes from, the full statement was, if you know yourself and know the other one, your enemy, then in literally in the Chinese, 10,000 uh, 10, battles, 10,000 victories. Now, obviously, that's kind of hyperbole, even the 100 that the uh, English translation uses is a bit of an exaggeration. We certainly know that there's no guarantee, either in physical battles, physical warfare, or what I'm going to be talking about, spiritual warfare, there's no guarantees that every battle is going to absolutely lead to victory in that battle. There are circumstances often beyond our control. 
But if we do really understand where, what our enemy is, what he is like, what his strategies are, and also understand what our resources are and know how to put them into effect, then maybe not 10,000 victories in 10,000 battles or even 100 victories in 100 battles, but we certainly do have better odds than we would otherwise have had. The Bible does indicate very clearly that we are in a war. It's not a physical one. We're not fighting against physical people here in this earth, although sometimes we may act that way. But we are in war against a spiritual foe. So to begin with, what do we know about our enemy? We know him as the devil or Satan. But to be honest, the Bible doesn't really give us a whole lot of details, either about his origins, how he came to be, who he is. And actually, in my opinion, most, uh, much of what is taught about him is unsupported and often based in misinterpretation of some passages that really don't teach what people think they teach. I'm not going to go into that, uh, what those ideas are. If you're really interested, you can corner me and ask me where I'm coming from on that. But they, that it all isn't really relevant to the points I want to examine today. My first point is this. We are told in 1 Peter 5.8 that the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. This really is the most important thing for us to remember. The devil is clearly an enemy. He doesn't have he never had good plans for us. He wants to devour us, to figuratively eat us up. Now, attitudes towards the devil have changed a lot over the centuries. During the Middle Ages, there was so much emphasis about uh, the devil and the, the way that he can attack us and his imps and demons and all of that, that Martin Luther wrote as a corrective to that fear that uh, people had. He wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and talked about why we don't have to worry so much, even as we are aware of his desire to devour us. But I think in our present day, we've gone a lot in the, excuse me, we've gone a lot in the other direction, I think, in our present day. Uh, don't hear it so much anymore, but at the time, that I was in college, this, there was the saying, oh, the devil made me do it, just kind of laughing off his influence in our lives. And we, we look at the way that he's treated in popular culture today, and it's like he's actually just one of those uh, nebulous supervillains, and the superhumans win the day against him no problem, we've got it handled. So we really do need to understand that he is a fierce foe, that he wants to bring us down to defeat. 
Another aspect of his nature that we're told about is that he's a liar and a deceiver. This is partially reflected, actually, in the main words used for him. The name Satan is a Hebrew word, Satan, that means an accuser. And the Greek word, diabolos, from which we get devil, goes a little bit further in saying that those are false accusations, that he is uh, a slanderer. And there's, although there's some debate uh, among scholars about whether in, in the book of Job where it refers to the Satan, literally there is a, uh, it's not just a name, but in Job it is the Satan. And there's debate about whether that is really talking about the person we know as Satan or whether it's just a, a descriptive term for just a, a, a general one of the angels who say, uh, made an accusation against Job. Ah, he's just uh, following you because you're so good to him. We do know that that was an accusation made against Job, even though we don't know for who is making the accusation, but we do know even further that in the Garden of Eden, Satan, the devil, appearing in the form of a serpent, set, made some false accusations against God. God isn't really on your side. God doesn't care about you. All he cares about is his own power. And if you eat that fruit, you're going to come into something that is far beyond your imagination that God doesn't want you to be in. He doesn't want you to be like him. But you could be if you eat that fruit. <laughs> Actually, when, God, uh, when the devil is making those kinds of accusations against God, he's really talking about himself, talking about his own desires, talking about what he wants. And he's putting them on God. But he is a liar. You cannot trust him when he makes those kinds of uh, accusations. Here's another thing that Jesus said about him when he was accusing the, the, the rulers, the Jewish rulers of his day uh, for their opposition to Jesus. He accused them of following the devil with this statement. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own because he is a liar and the father of lies. That's John chapter 8 if you want to look it up sometime. Closely related to calling him a liar is that he's a master of misdirection. Many years ago, uh, I don't even remember who it was, what the circumstances were, but a, I heard a speaker say that even uh, the, that statement about Satan as a warring lion actually has a hidden meaning to it, a uh, meaning that we might not think about. And I, I don't really think that that necessarily was intended when the statement was made, when Peter said that about the devil. But 
I'll get to it in a moment, that it is an, a good application of the way that the devil does work. What the speaker said was that uh, the, the lion that roars the loudest isn't necessarily the one that you have to fear most. That sometimes, he said, the weakest, the oldest lion in a pack will serve to drive the prey towards the other lions who aren't making so much noise, but just waiting for the prey to come to them, and then they pounce. Now, I don't know how accurate that is about uh, lions and their behavior. I do know that it is a practice that ha it has historically been used a lot by human hunters for their prey, where they hire beaters to go out and make a lot of noise and drive the uh, deer or w whatever towards the hunters with their rifles. And it certainly is a tactic that the devil uses because he is a master of misdirection. He wants to get our attention onto other th places, other things, besides where our attention really should be. And in the, uh, associated with that, another description that is given of the devil in the New Testament is that he disguises himself very often as an angel of light. Hey, don't worry about me, I'm your friend. <laughs> it's really the same thing he was doing back in the Garden of Eden. But when he misdirects us, some of the things that he misdirects us towards are very, very dangerous to our spiritual life. He wants us to see as our enemies people who are really on the same side as we are, people who really are doing their best to follow God in the same way that we're doing our best to follow God. Oh, he doesn't go to our church. You can't trust him. Eh, I don't think I can... Uh, join him in this effort because that's another uh, denomination. I don't want to give them any credit or any help. But rather we should see that they are really on our side and give them the benefit of the doubt when we are not sure. Yes, point out at times, things that we think are false teachings. But don't just say, eh, can't have anything to do with them. Because the devil very much wants us to lose our focus on him and his desires and get us off onto side issues. Same thing applies to politics very often, but I'm not going <laughs> to go into that right now. So, that's our enemy. This is really little more than an overview. There's, there's a lot more probably could, that could be said about the devil and uh, both speculation and things that are actually taught about him in the Bible. But the important thing is to realize what his goals are and to get an idea of the tactics he uses. We need to be aware 
of that if we're going to into go into battle with him. But knowing your enemy and knowing yourself go hand in hand. If you just focus on knowing the devil, you can get discouraged thinking, oh no, I'm, I, can't, I can't handle this whole situation. You can get very discouraged if you just focus on the devil or even worse, you can start to get so fascinated with him that you start slipping over to his side. So you need to know what strengths you can bring to the battle and how that helps you. Now, of the greatest importance in understanding your side of the battle is to know your commander and what his plans are, along with how those plans involve you. We are on God's side. This is the creator of the universe that we're talking about. He is also the one who is going to wrap things up. Some of the songs that we sang this morning already are looking forward to that, that he is going to bring everything together, that his plan is not completed yet although the important aspects of it have been taken care of. But there is a time when we will see, we will actually see the full and complete victory that we can only get a taste of in individual battles right now. The devil may be strong, but God is stronger. Only the question that matters in our own spiritual battles is how much we are willing to rely on our commander and to follow his battle plan. Nor are we left in the dark about what that battle plan is. Spelled out for us in God's word, the Bible if we will take the time to familiarize ourselves with it. That's all part of knowing who our commander is, knowing what plan he has for this spiritual warfare. Many of our lost battles are because we're not using the battle plan. Let us never forget that Jesus, by dying on the cross and then rising from the dead, has conquered death for us. As well as the battle plan, the Bible is our armory. We need to be fully familiar with our armament. You've heard sermons before about the whole armor of God, so I'm not going to belabor the individual items or go into detail about this or that. Uh, you can preach a whole sermon on just the armor of God, and I'm not going to. But here's the list. Truth buckled around our waists. Righteousness to protect us against frontal attacks. The preparation of the gospel of peace to carry us forward, which brings us back to knowing the Bible, actually, the gospel of peace and the preparation for our battle. Faith as a shield, salvation to protect our heads, and God's sword, there's the Bible again, as our main weapon of battle. Finally, recognize your role in the battle. Any army worth its reputation 
has soldiers who are prepared for certain tasks. Now, the particular passage I want us to look at, think about here, doesn't really talk about the uh, battlefield, doesn't talk about soldiers. It uses a, uh, a different figure of speech, but it's one that very much applies to our position in God's army. And that is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, talking about one body, many members. And this applies very much too to our army. We have different roles. We have different abilities. Some people are good at one, um, better at one thing. Some people are better at another thing. But if we look for and understand what our own personal strengths are and how we fit in with everybody else in the army of God, then we have a better chance of ongoing victory and a better chance to go forward successfully time after time, battle after battle. As I pointed out in the first half about Satan's desire to misdirect us into petty squabbles, we need to recognize that we all, individually, in our separate ways, are in this together against Satan. I debated ha uh, asking for us to sing the song, Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. There's several verses to the, the song. But down in the third verse, the second half of it, uh, that I want to focus on is my point here. We are not divided, all one body we one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. We're one. We're one body. We're one army against Satan. We have a great commander. We don't need to fear Satan, although we do need to understand him. but we need to see what our individual roles are. And very importantly, we need to work together. Father, I thank you for giving us a clear indication of what we are up against and how we can defeat the enemy. We thank you for Christ and his sacrifice and, and the way that he has actually conquered death for it so that that is one last thing that we have to fear. Help us, Lord, to be fully committed to your army, to the defeat of Satan. And help us work together, Lord, Join together, work together, fight together, and be one body, one arm.